Hey, well, welcome, First Baptist Jinx family. Always good to see you. Uh, friends and guests, we are so glad that you are here as well. Uh, this is a great place to follow Jesus. And so uh, just continue to lean in. Those that are joining us online, continue to lean in. We are, as you can tell, continuing our series through the book of Luke. That's what we do here. We just study through books. And so uh, we're going through uh, the book of Luke, chapter 6, verse 12 is where we're going to start today. If you have your Bibles or those Bible journals we've uh, provided, you can go ahead and turn to Luke 6, 12. Uh, but we are in a new series because now Jesus is really uh, installing his kingdom, uh, this upside-down kingdom that feels reverse from everything the world normally thinks. And really what he's doing is right-side-upping uh, the kingdom that, we, that we'd messed up. And this is going to start, like I said, in Luke 6 with three things that he's going to do in our text today. And Jesus is going to appoint his apostles, he is going to heal multitudes, and he's going to teach his disciples now, what you hear in that is these layers of ways that people view Jesus already. Did you catch it? Like we, all the way back to Luke 2, uh, Luke 3, we start to see his interactions. There are people who reject Jesus. There are people who oppose Jesus, the scribes and Pharisees. There are people who see Jesus as a means for healing. There are people who see Jesus as a means for life, the disciples who, who come to him. And now there's going to be the people who see Jesus as the one who's sending them, the apostles. And that's still true today, that there are these layers of relationship to Jesus. It's always going to be that way. There's always going to be people in the world that have these different viewpoints of who Jesus is. And what matters is knowing that the way you see Jesus determines the way you see your life. And it may sound oversimplifying. Hey, Cody, my, my thoughts about one thing are really going to determine the way I see everything else. And the answer is Yes. Your thoughts about Jesus will determine the way you see everything else in your life. So it's essential that we see him for who he truly is. So let's watch the way that he lives his life. Let's watch the way he handles this moment. Before we get into those activities or something Jesus does, we find it in verse 12. Luke 6, 12 says, In these days he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. Before Jesus joins in the activity of God, appointing apostles, healing people, and teaching. He pursues intimacy with God. A beautiful model of what's essential for us. Before we busy ourselves with the activity of God, we have to pursue intimacy with God. And Luke continues to bring this up to make sure that we get it in the right order. Because you'll notice this happens. There's uh, powerful moments of prayer, praying all night in Jesus' case, before powerful movements of God. And that's where prayer belongs. It doesn't happen after the fact. Right? I was meeting with my D group a couple weeks ago, and one of the guys had mentioned as we were talking about prayer, he said, man, I had this big thing with work going on. And it was just on my mind constantly. And I'm troubleshooting, and I'm thinking through it. I'm trying to figure it out. Every, every waking moment, it just shows back up. Was three days of that when he realized he hadn't prayed once about it. Anybody feel me? Your brain could just be going, going, going. And you're like, time out. The literal creator of the universe is on speed dial, just hanging out. All the resources of all time. And I failed to mention this to him once. So easy to happen. And so prayer doesn't belong after our best efforts. It's not where prayer belongs. Prayer also doesn't belong in the middle of our long shots. It's what they call the, the last play of football, a Hail Mary, for that reason. Right? Like we're just going to launch this in the middle of me being like, I sure hope this works. Lord, help. It's, it's not where prayer belongs. Prayer is where we prepare. That's what Jesus models. He prepares in prayer. It happens before you take a step, before you take a breath, before you start your day, before you step into whatever God already knows is going to happen in your day. You prepare yourself in those steps with intimacy with God before activity with him. So Jesus models that. What does he do coming out of this pursuit of God? By the way, I, do, I just want to mention Hebrews, I'm sorry, not Hebrews, Romans chapter 8. Um, I think it's around 34 mentions that Jesus is still praying for us, by the way. I just, I just want to encourage you with that. Jesus is praying. Because you might be like, why does Jesus have to pray, pray, pray to God? Well, there's this communion between them that's just perfect, and he's still doing that right now. He's praying to God on your behalf whenever you are God's children. It's just incredible to think about. 
So the praying Jesus, it says, day comes and he calls his disciples and he chooses from them 12 whom he named apostles. Now this is just a little Bible information for you. You've probably heard the 12 apostles. And if you're around church a little bit, someone will say the 12 disciples. They mean the same thing. All right, because they were disciples first, but then he takes the disciples and he makes 12 of them into apostles. So uh, I just, you don't have to correct your friends if someone says 12 disciples. Don't be that person. So uh, we, we know what they're, th- they're talking about. And here's who they're talking about. They are talking about Simon, whom he named Peter, Andrew, his brother, and James and John, and Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Luke is not subtle. (laughs) Hey, you know the guy I mentioned last? Traitor. (laughs) That's who he is. And in that sense, by the way, Judas, as we're going to get to that point where he does become a traitor, he, he forfeits his his spot as being an apostle in that sense. And so Jesus then uh, approaches Paul later on, is going to bring Paul into that apostleship role. And so Paul will describe himself as the least of all apostles, as, as one late to the party of being an apostle. And Paul is going to explain to us that he, he's the final one. In Ephesians 2, he says that the house of God, and that doesn't mean a physical house, it means that the saved people of God that he's saving, he's building us into like a living structure right, over time, but it's built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, built being past tense and foundation being final. Here's a foundation. All the prophets of the Old Testament and all the things the apostles teach in the New Testament, that is set, everything from there is being constructed up for the glory of God and the work of God. And so uh, if if you have a different background or uh, confusion around that, uh, there won't be another person who fulfills an office of apostle or office of prophet. So it's not something you have to worry about. Those things are done. And apostle really just means sent with authority. What marks these 12 apostles, being 11, uh, these original 12, and then 13 if you add Paul in, is that the 12 with Paul, they, they experienced the resurrected Jesus. And the resurrected Jesus gave them a specific assignment. And they're the ones who had that. So they model for us, even though they're the only apostles, they model for us what Jesus does to every single person who comes to him. He moves people from sinners to sent. He causes us to live sent with our lives. So not only does he prepare in prayer, he leads us to live a sent life by him. And so even though we won't be apostles, God will appoint every person who comes to him in their sinfulness to belong to him and eventually say, hey, I want you to share in my mission and share my message. That, if, if you're wondering, where's Jesus leading me? Where's God taking me in my life? What's he doing with me? He is leading you to the place that you share his mission, cooperate with Jesus in seeing the good news change lives, and you share his message. It's where we're headed. So with these that he called to himself, he then comes down with them, verse 17, and stood on a level place. So a lot of people call this the Sermon on the Plain instead of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, And there's a chance that it was the same sermon. Most likely Jesus preached some of the same things in different places. And so this is a, a setting here. There's a great crowd of his disciples. So he comes down with his apostles, has a crowd of his disciples, and a great multitude of people from all over Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out from him and healed them all. Don't miss what's happening here. Jesus, after a night-long prayer, appoints his disciples. He comes down, or his apostles. He's got his apostles, a ragtag bunch of people. He's got his disciples all there. that have, They've left things to figure out how to live. And then all of these people with all their suffering and all their diseases and all their unclean spirits just pouring in on him. And a miraculous wave of power breaks out. People are touching him and being healed, touching him and being healed, touching him and being healed. He's going through this crowd and life changed, life changed, life changed, infirmity gone. Now you're clean. I mean, just, can you imagine that scene? Now in our Western culture, we're like, oh, like, pff, if that breaks out, like, like that's the thing, right? Suddenly, I mean, th- this kind of thing happening, like that would just be incredible. And Jesus does what seems to be one of the oddest things. He interrupts a service of miraculous power with teaching. He interrupts the great experience with explaining. And what he does in, in this is he, balance, he brings balance to these two things because 
following Jesus requires both. Right? To just have a faith that's about explaining, hearing all the time but never experiencing the power of God, that's like someone reading the instructions of a game to you but not letting you play. Can you imagine that as a kid? You sit down and you're like, just, here's all the instructions to connect for. Hang on, there's seven pages. And just read it. And then like, you know, mom just puts it up. Uh-uh. I want those little checkers. I want to do that. Right? Like that, that's how you'd respond. In our faith, though, it's possible to have a faith that is Bible study after Bible study, sermon after sermon, listening after listening after listening, and we never actually play the game. We never leverage our faith. We never lean in. We never watch God provide. We never see him change lives. We don't run to the hurting. So that's no good. The opposite's also true. It can't be all experience with no explanation. I just want to feel things and watch God do things. I want to see it, but I don't understand what's going on. It makes me think of the uh, grandpa who was given a gift at Christmas uh, by his adult children. And so they come back and they're like, hey, Pop, how are you enjoying the gift? He's like, oh, I love it. And he pulls out an iPad and he sits it down. And he puts a tomato on top of it and goes, kick, 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 kick. <laughs> just scrapes the tomato off. And they just stare in disbelief, right? That's thousands of dollars. And you think it's a cutting board. You are wasting the gift we got you. There's so much that can do. Do you see why we need explanation? Jesus healing people. Why? That's the question. If he doesn't explain to them, here's why you're healed, they would leave thinking, oh, this is what Jesus came for. Jesus came to make my life better. Jesus came to make me feel good. Jesus came to fix my problem. Jesus came so I could have my best life now. Oh, I got healed. That must be what he wants for me. He wants this life to be so good. Jesus loves them too much to let them believe that, right? So he breaks into teaching in the middle of that to say, hey, we need explanation and experience should move together. We need to understand what God's saying in his word, but we should experience the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So in the middle of this move of power, he teaches he lifts his eyes on his disciples and he says, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and they revile you and they spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day. Leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. Jesus introduces this line as evidence. How do I know? How do I know that that's actually the blessed life? He says, because the prophets who spoke the word from God, doing the work of God, were treated this way. So you can know that you're doing the right thing. But he continues, verse 24, Woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. Evidence there again. Right? Well, how do I know that that's not, not a good life? Well, because when the false prophets showed up and they just told people what they wanted to hear, they delivered what people wanted from them instead of what God was actually telling them. People loved to hear it. So they treated them really well. Now, if you're a kid in the room and you're listening and you're like, whoa, like what, what does whoa mean? This is not whoa like you're impressed, like whoa. This is more like whoa, like oh, slow down, whoa. It's a word of caution, warning. Hey, hey, stop, 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 stop. You're in a dangerous space. Now, I, I do, I want to be really clear and upfront because you could read this and say, all right, time out. So does this mean every poor person is thus going to heaven? And if I have money, I am not? <laughs> like, it's a little concerning. Uh, that, that's, it's not what it's saying. And in fact, we got to really dig into this to make sure we don't confuse what it's saying, all right? So I, so I don't want you to think that... You, your faith in Jesus Christ is what secures your salvation. Now, that being said, if we read this wrong, it can cause all kinds of problems. Because you might leave today and be like, blessed are the poor. So you head to lunch, and you see one of our friends who has a cardboard sign asking for help. And you're like, I paid attention to the sermon. You roll down the window, and you say, keep it up, man. Living the dream. Roll up your window. and get... 
that would be terrible application, right? Because it doesn't line up with the compassion of God for people in need. You're like, oh, that can't make sense. And, and if you keep applying it, then you're like, I guess I never eat again because I'm supposed to be hungry. And I guess I never laugh. I'm committed to not laughing from this day forward. Sometimes I think some of you might have already made that commitment. <laughs> and maybe I just haven't figured out like your laugh buttons yet. But we'll get there. And that was a joke. <laughs> Please don't be angry. But we would see this, and we would be like, blessed are you whenever people hate you. You wake up one morning, and you're like, man, a lot of people like me. I'm too nice. Time to go tick some people off. <laughs> What'd you do today? Live for the Lord. Angered everybody. <laughs> right? Like, th this, uh, that application doesn't make sense. So there's got to be more going on here than that. And, and our, we have a couple of clues as to what that is, and, and some of it is, like, that's scaling out, right, from a big picture. That doesn't make sense. If you zoom into the text, you're going to notice that there's a command. The only command in the whole first part is that you should rejoice whenever you experience this kind of suffering. Well, if I'm supposed to rejoice and leap for joy, that sounds a lot like laughter, but then a couple verses later, it says, you who laugh now will weep and mourn later. So, so am I supposed to be happy or am I not supposed to be happy? The clue is found in the audience. Look back at verse 20. Who is he talking to? And you can answer out loud as you look at it. Disciples. He's talking to his disciples. When you get down to verse 22, the very end of it, the phrase is, on account of the Son of Man. Son of Man is the way Jesus talks about himself in third person, during, the way Luke records it, right? It's from Daniel chapter 7. It's a title for him. That's the key. The way we see Jesus He's preaching this to people who said, I'm leaving everything to follow you. I'm rejecting the comfort of riches and uh, the way people talk about me and all that. Nothing else matters to me except for you, Jesus. That's a disciple. I'm coming to you for life, to learn how to live. That's who he's speaking to. And in that sense, we start to get a better picture of what this means. Because that word blessed or happy, or my, my favorite uh, description, one of the ones that I read said, to be envied. To be envied are those who are poor. We're like, uh-uh, Jesus put it in the wrong side. We envy the people that are rich. We envy the people that are full. We envy the people that ha are carefree. No matter what's going on, they're laughing, they're having a good time. They don't have a care in the world. We envy the people that everybody loves. And he says, not in my kingdom. Why would you envy the poor or the hungry or the weeping. See, as we realize that this all has to do with our connection to Jesus, we find actually a whole lot of hope in this text. If this is about following Jesus and experiencing life abundant and life eternal, then the truth is, if you physically have experienced poverty or hunger or suffering or loss, or rejection, you're at an advantage to following God. You have an advantage. Why? Because you have to leave everything to follow God. And if you've never experienced being full of all the other things that the world has to offer, you're that much closer. <laughs> because the only way to get to the cross is on empty. It's the only way to find life is on empty. When you decide the riches and the fullness and all the things the world says to envy and all the things says will fill you, that I, I actually don't need those for life. I just need the presence of God in my life. You have to empty yourself to get to the cross. And so he's saying, as all these people crowd in who are suffering, who are outcasts, who are rejected, he goes, I want to encourage you. Now is not the whole story. Now, it's not the whole story. Maybe in this life, you don't have, but you've turned to me, guess what? <laughs> you don't have to worry because yours is the kingdom of God. And maybe in this life, you're hungry and you're aware of all that you don't have and you're longing. You don't have to worry because you will be satisfied. And maybe in this life, you are weeping and broken. But you will laugh now, consider all these in context of your relationship to Jesus. Maybe in this life, that spiritual poverty, where you realize, 
I have nothing I bring to the table, but everything to receive from God, I come to him on empty. Where you hunger for God. You say, God, I, I, I don't want anything else in this life. I just want you. And that kind of hunger, God says, if you're hungry for me that way, you're going to be filled. And you weep on account of things that make God weep. And so you weep over your sin, and you weep over the pain that your sin causes other people. You weep over the pain that other people's sin causes other people. And so in this life, you're like, it's broken, and it's sad, and it's not good. And Jesus says, yeah, weep over those things, because now is not the whole story. There's so much more. And at the same time, he's given this encouragement. He also says, hey, don't envy, don't envy the rich. Don't get caught up in that because now is not their whole story. If they're putting their trust and their value and their identity in being rich, this is all they're ever going to have. We've said it before and we'll keep saying it again. Without Christ, this is the best life you will ever have. With Christ, now is the worst life you'll ever have. And so he's telling them, hey, it is better to be poor with Christ than to be rich without him. The poor with Christ has more. So don't envy them. Don't envy the ones that their lives are full now, that they can meet whatever needs they have. Because those who put their trust in that, they're going to mourn and weep. I'm sorry, they're going to be hungry. Don't envy the ones who just laugh at life. They laugh at sin. They laugh at other people's suffering. They're just, they, they just don't care. They're carefree because they're fine. There's going to come a day if, if they're going to mourn and weep. The people that everybody loves and everybody talks well of. And if somebody is putting their hope in that and their comfort in that, you don't need to envy it. So it's this great word of encouragement, isn't it? But it's also a word of warning. Because at the same time that we should be deeply encouraged, you go, man, if I come to God on empty, I get filled. What a promise. There's this word of warning to say, hey, for, for you that do have if you are rich, be on guard. If you're full, be on guard. If you're carefree in life, be on guard. If everybody loves you, be on guard. Why? Because the pain of emptiness is what drives us to the cross. And if in our life and provision, we can put things in our life to numb the pain, we can buy more things and have more stuff and enjoy more stuff. And we, we can actually do that to numb some of the emptiness that is meant to drive us to the cross. And we could do that so much that we miss Jesus. That's the word of warning, especially in our culture, in our day, in our family. And Jesus loves us too much to say, hey, Enjoy the comforts of life. He says, no, if I've given those to you, don't let them blind you to your need for me. And in this sense, what he's done is he's not given us places to aim for, right? I'm not aiming for poverty or aiming to starve or aiming to be a jerk to people. <laughs> he's giving us an understanding of the states we find ourselves in. So if you're in this church family and you find yourself in poverty if you feel poor, if you feel the absence of resources, physical resources, spiritual resources, relational resources, if you feel that poverty, if you feel that hunger, that lack in your life, if you feel the things that cause you to weep and cry and hurt, be encouraged. Now is not the whole story. It's, it's just not. Jesus made it really clear. And in the same sense, if you're here and you're like, man, life's really good, <laughs> right? God, God, by his design, in the same way that God has given some of us poverty, and again, be thankful for it, rejoice in it. Why? You've got less things between you and the Lord. That's why Paul was so excited for his weakness. I love getting beat up and thrown in prison, <laughs> right? It ain't going to make me live for today. Beep. Rejoice. Rejoice in that. And if you're on the other side, be careful. Be warned. Pay attention. Don't substitute the things of this life for what only Jesus was meant to fill. And so even if you have the things, come to him at a spiritual poverty, at a spiritual emptiness to say, God, I, these things may be present in my life. They are not my joy. They are not what fills me. They are not the kingdom I'm living for. It is you. 
And there you can rejoice and be filled by the promises that we live for. Now is not forever. So don't envy the ones that you think have it well. And don't grieve over what you think you don't have. Do not be afraid of poverty and pain in this life. Be afraid of the ability to numb it so much that you would miss all that God has for you. Let's respond. If you'd bow your heads, close your eyes. I want to spend some time in prayer. God, thank you for putting this on the heart of Jesus to teach his disciples. The people that said they want to follow him, that they want to belong to him, but yet need a way to understand the situation of life they're in. God, for my brothers and sisters in this room, for the friends, uh, guests that are here, I just pray that those that feel the weight of loss and emptiness and poverty and that this life isn't what it should be, God, I pray today they'd be encouraged, that they'd be so confident that the, all of the resources of the kingdom of God await them. Oh, what a promise. We could go out and get everything we can lay our hands on today and it would be a speck compared to the resources of an eternal kingdom. <laughs> So God, encourage us that feel the emptiness and the loss and the desperate need that we're in a great position to experience you. Uh, for the brothers and sisters in this room, the friends and their guests that are here who come in having just what the world calls the best life. I pray that in this moment, Lord, you would peel their fingers from it. That you would show them you have better. That they wouldn't put their hope in it. They wouldn't find their identity in it. They wouldn't use it to make their lives comfortable. But instead, God, they would love you so fiercely and deeply that it means nothing to them. Nothing but gifts to steward to advance your kingdom. God, the prayer for both the fool and the hungry, the rich and the poor, the weeping and the laughing, all of us today, as we want nothing but you. May you satisfy us alone. It's in Jesus' name we ask these things, amen.